right, all right. What's happening, everybody? Welcome to Gonzo and the Judge Sports Talk, Wednesday night, December 28, 2022. Man, been a good night in sports tonight, man. Some good uh, college football bowl games tonight. Got another good one right now with uh, North Carolina and Oregon in the fourth quarter. There's been some good games. Uh, but joined by the sports judge, Jonathan Mathis. How's it going, Judge? What's up, man? What's what's going on? Yes, happy Wednesday to you. It is the final Wednesday of 2022, as we will be bringing in the new year very soon. And once again, happy Wednesday. As you guys can see on my shirt, it's Wednesday. It is Wednesday. Let's do our thing. Let's have a lot of fun. We got a lot to talk about tonight, Chris. It's going to be great, and I'm glad that Stack Guy has joined in on all the fun. This should be a very good show. Uh, that's what we do best over here, and let's talk sports. And thanks to all our viewers out there for joining us as well. Uh, honestly, Chris, I have not been following much of these bowl games. I, I'm i over it. Um, I don't get into these bowl games because I just think there's too many. Uh, there's too much to keep up with, and I've just never really gotten into them like that. Now, I will be tuned in, and my eyes will be glued to the TV when the playoffs start. Yeah, man, there, there's been some good games today. Can, uh, Kansas and Arkansas was real good, went into three overtimes. Now you got Oregon and North Carolina, 24-21. Uh, North Carolina with like five minutes left in the game. So, I mean, there's been, been some good games today, but – uh. Also joined by the stat guy. How's it going, Dustin? Not bad, guys. Figured I'd pop in for a little bit tonight while I'm at work. Oh. You, you've, been, you've been watching any of these college bowl games? Not really. Um, not for the same reasons Jonathan hasn't been watching him. I've just been extremely busy. I mean, I catch highlights here and there, but I really haven't sat down and watched – Entire game start to finish. I probably will this week with the uh, TCU, Michigan, and then Ohio State, Georgia games. Yeah. The, the game, the games, they've been real good. And I'll tell you what, this Drake, this Drake May, he's he's, he's going to be good. Some of the throws he's made tonight in this game for only being a freshman is pretty crazy. But uh, what do you got? What do you guys think about De uh, Derek Carr getting benched? Uh, for the last two games of the season, and not only that, they're basically have, like removed him from. They're keeping him away from the team because they said he, they're afraid he's going to be a distraction. But there has to be some something going on behind the scenes, I would say, because I mean, on the outside, it don't seem like Derek Carr's a, a, a distraction. And where they are, are are the Raiders done with Carr? And where's Carr going to yeah. end up? It's a uh, it's going to be interesting. I think this is I think this is a sign that the Raiders are ready to move on from Derek Carr. I think we might have seen the end to what has been a dark chapter. I think the end of the Derek Carr era has officially come uh uh to an end. And you know, it it it's it sucks that it's gonna end this way for, for Derek Carr. Um Derek Carr had his worst season in a Raiders uniform and his buddy came to join him this season and, and he still looked pretty bad. It, it was an awful campaign for him. Um, I'm pretty sure it's one he wants to forget about. And, you know, I joked a little bit about this earlier. Um, you know, I, I posted a meme. I don't know if you guys seen it, you know, it blew up on TikTok or whatever, but uh, in all seriousness, uh, it just didn't work out for Derek Carr uh, like most people thought it would uh, from the start of the season. You know, it's been a disappointing year. Uh, but do, does all of this fall on Derek Carr? Uh, would it be fair to place all the blame on Derek Carr when you have a, a guy who is clueless in Josh McDaniels, a guy who's not that great of a coach who has proved once before that he's not, you know, head coaching material? Uh does, did he put him in the best position to succeed as a quarterback? You know, so I, I know that there's got to be a fall guy, and Derek Carr obviously looks like the fall guy. 
Um, you know, this is a guy who's been through so many rebuilds. He's been through countless rebuilds. Uh, he's been through countless coaches. Uh, he had to, you know, learn uh, new, a new playbook. He had to uh, learn a, a new system each time. And, you know, it, it's hard to try to gain knowledge of a, a new playbook in such a short time. Uh, so all of that can be factored into why Derek Carr also performed the way he did this season and didn't live up to his own standards, nor did he live up to the standards of the, the Vegas uh, Raiders as well. You're muted. What do you think about the Derek Carr situation, stat guy? <laughs> I mean, I mean, given the circumstances where the Raiders are right now, I think this is the telling sign that Derek Carr is done in Vegas. I'm not going to be surprised to see him end up in Indianapolis next year. I'm not going to be surprised to see him end up in Minnesota because there was talk a couple of years ago that Minnesota was going to try to trade for Derek Carr as opposed to extending Kirk Cousins, and they eventually extended Kirk Cousins, so that'll be kind of a move to watch this off season. But the other curious note about this is Jared Stidham is taking over. Jared Stidham was in new England last year with Josh McDaniels. So you got to think that Josh McDaniels believes in Jared Stidham enough to not only bring him from new England to Las Vegas, but now to give him basically these final two starts of the year to maybe audition for the starting job in Vegas next year, if that's the direction that Josh McDaniels wants to go, because I think the Raiders are about to enter a full blown rebuild mode. Yeah, I, I think I think it came down that he's done he's done with the Raiders, and the Raiders didn't want to take a chance of him getting hurt, and they're going they're going to try to work out a trade or something to get rid of him. I do see him maybe in, ending up in maybe like in Indianapolis, which I'd be fine with. I think Derek Car Derek Carr is a good quarterback. I mean, if you look at all the numbers he's put up and how many different coaches and coordinators he's had, he's never had the luxury luxury of being like in a set system. In a, I just, I don't know if it's McDaniel's or if it's just him, the system, McDaniel's system, and him, and he's having trouble picking it up. Because I know when McDaniel's was in New England, you always heard when receivers went there that that was a real hard offense to pick up. So maybe Carr struggle, struggling get, getting McDaniel's system down. But I also think, to me, I think it's a move for the Raiders that I think the Raiders are going to try to make a push to get Tom Brady uh, to play to play another year and, and go, go there to, to the uh, Raiders with uh, McDaniels and they have Devontae Adams as a weapon. So I wouldn't be surprised if this isn't maybe a move towards them trying to get Brady in uh, for next season. I mean, there's a possibility that that could happen. I, I think Brady is done after this season, though. You think he's done? I don't know. I think he's done. He, he's he been in steady decline. I, I think this is the end for him. I think he'll finally come to his senses and say, you know what? <laughs> come to his senses, damn. <laughs> yeah, I think so. He's going to come to his senses and say, you know what? Um, I can't the, dude, do this the, dude played, the dude played at a high level last year. How is it, he's coming to a season? Yeah, I was... this season he hasn't played <laughs> as, at, at such a high level. And he hasn't really. You look at his numbers; he hasn't played terrible this year. They yeah. haven't been able to score points. I think he's done in Tampa Bay, but I don't think he's done playing just because I don't think he's going to go out like this. No, I think I think he's going to play at least one more year. He's not going to go if, out. Even, with... if, even if he does go out like this, though, it it still shouldn't really hurt his legacy. Oh no! He, you know, you know, with his competitive nature, though, this is not how he's going to go out. He's right. not going to go out with having the worst. Right. He's not going to go out having the worst season he's ever had. He's not going to go out with possibly missing the playoffs. If he's going to go out, he's going to go down swinging. Whether it's in the playoffs, whether it's in the Super Bowl or something else, he's not going to go out basically eight and nine, nine and eight, limping into the playoffs and going home, kind of a first-round exit. And then, Well, then yeah, I'll tell you this. You don't want to go to the Raiders then if they're going into a rebuild. You want to go to a team that, that is, is in win-now mode, if you can. Uh, well, if some, people, some, some people think maybe the 49ers. <clears throat> yeah, well, it, it would have put them close to home. He's from the Bay Area. Uh, Aaron Rodgers was also linked there at one point, too. 
you know, so yeah, he could he could end up with the 49ers as well. And if he that would be a great team for him because he could go out on top if he goes there. You know, know. he could ride off into the sunset with a Super Bowl championship. You look at the defense that the 49ers have. Yeah. And I know it's a short sample size, but the 49ers look like they might have found the might have found their guy in, in uh, Brock Purdy. Mm-hmm. It's looking that way. And I know it's a small sample size, but hey, uh Purdy has looked impressive in such a short time. Uh, you know, he has you know commanded the offense. Um, he has made big time plays. Um, he has found his um, intended targets has found his playmakers, put them in in great situations to flourish. So, hey, you know we, the the Forty Niners might be onto something with Purdy. Yeah, yeah, Purdy Purdy's been been impressive so far, and he's he's oh, doing he's what he has to do in that system. He's doing what yeah. he has to do in that system. He's surrounded by so many weapons that he just has to manage the game. Don't make don't make the don't turn the ball over. Don't make the big mistake. That's, that's right. all he, he has to do because he has you have one of the best defenses in the league, and then you're surrounded with weapons. Just don't make that big mistake, and you're going to be in you're going to be in ball games because of your defense. Oh, absolutely. <clears throat> and that's what the 49ers have done so well. Well, right, is that their defense uh, takes a lot of pressure off of the offense. And the offense doesn't really have to do much because the defense is able to carry, uh, you know, the, the 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 team for the most part. That's what's so exceptional about the 49ers. What's up, Mike? What's up, Mike Hughes? What up, Jay? What what's going up? on, man? Thanks for joining the Not show good. tonight. Where are you driving yes, to? Yes, sir. He's rolling uh, through I Chicago. Dropped... <laughs> <laughs> I just dropped my girl off, so... uh I'm just, yeah, uh, Gonzo hit it 100%. Nice. It's great to see you, man. We haven't really collaborated in a while. It's been a minute. Nah, not in a minute. Not in a minute. Yeah, not, a I, didn't, and I didn't even tell Jonathan that you was going to come on, so it, it was a surprise to him. <laughs> oh, yes. yeah, I'm sorry I'm late. I am sorry I'm late. No, it's okay. I did it hey, you're, fa- you're fashionably late. That's That's okay. I'm okay with that. The Chicago no, we were, way, baby. The Chicago we were way. Talking, we were talking Raiders uh, benching Derek Carr for the last two games and basically removing him from the team. Uh, yeah. What's your thoughts on that, and where do you think Derek Carr might end up at? It must be fucking nice. It must be nice. I wish they benched Justin Fields. No reason to play, but whatever. That's a whole different conversation. But, um, no, I mean, I think it speaks volumes. I think it really does. Um, one of the biggest issues I feel like going on right now in the in the in the Raiders organization, Jonathan's here. I almost said the Lakers organization. Um, I know my guys talking all Lakers all the time, but um, same problem is you really don't know who the face of your franchise is. And Derek Carr is in a weird situation contractually. I mean, you look at you know his situation right now. He has a no trade clause. Um, for the next remaining of his contract, which I believe is four years. And he's making a, a pretty, pretty penny uh, playing these next four years. But the conversation is if they cut him at the end of this season, you know, there's a there's a lot of money that's taken off of that, and they don't have to pay him as much. Now, it's obviously going to hurt towards the cap, um, but it's better to get away from it now than later on. So, you know, they're not going to be able to trade him. That's just not in the conversation. So, um, Gonzo, I think, you know, Gonzo, I think that's the answer to that question. I think he's going to be an Indianapolis Colt. I think that's how it's going to look. They love, uh, they love giving white boys their third or fourth chance in the league. That's just what it is. Um, but no, in all seriousness, you know, I, I don't think this is a conversation if they don't have a top five pick, if they weren't getting Bryce Young or CJ Stroud or, um, I believe his name is Lewis or somebody else, um, you know, Levis. within that top five. Yeah, Levis, pardon me. Uh, thank you. But I don't think they make this move. But with him, with them being in that position and, you know, potentially even getting a top two pick, depending on what happens with the Chicago Bears and obviously the Houston Texans, um, it's going to be really interesting to see what pans out with that. But I would say I'm going to go off on a limb 
I'm going to say he ends up in Green Bay. That's how I feel. And I'll be honest, if he does end up in Indianapolis, I wouldn't be mad because I don't I don't think Carr's a bad quarterback. I mean, he, he's had a lot of different no, coaches, just, went through yeah. a lot of different systems, and he's uh, and he's been competitive. So I mean, I I wouldn't be mad if the Colts made made that move because I don't know if you're going to find anybody better than him right now. And I also like how he takes accountability. He's not like Zach Wilson, who's going to say <laughs> that uh, you know it was the it was the win that 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 you know. Uh, caused him to have a terrible game, you know. That that's not that's not Derek Carr's character, right? So that's what I like about Derek Carr too is that he takes on leadership, and you know, um, people have always said great things about him. Unfortunately, it has not worked out in Vegas. Whatever's going on, we don't have the whole story, but it's obvious that his days. In in Vegas is is coming to an end, I uh, gradually and and he will be you know given a change of scenery and able to do it somewhere else next season most likely. Yeah. And then I'm I do think though, uh, my bad, Gonzo, but oh, Gonzo yeah. and I actually talked about this on the afternoon show. Um, I think there's a difference between taking accountability and learning from your mistakes. I do like Derek's been in the league for a very long time. And I think a lot of people don't realize that, especially for a quarterback. Not everybody's Rodgers, not everybody's Brady. Um, But at some point, I do want to see Derek Carr actually start winning football games. I think there's a conversation of, oh, well, before he got injured, I think it was like 2016, 2015, you know, they were on an amazing run, and had they not got injured. And as Pride said earlier, you know. Might have been MVP that year. Right, but Pride made an analogy earlier about his aunt, and if you don't know that analogy, you can definitely check it out on my Facebook. I'm not going to repeat it, but it's basically saying your aunt could be your uncle, but she's not, and that's and that's just the reality. So, I mean, we could have, should have, would have. Um, Darren Waller, obviously Hunter Renfro, you bring in Josh Jacobs off, a, off an injured season last year. Josh Jacobs is looking like the second coming of Derrick Henry right now and CMC combined, and then you have Devontae Adams. So, I don't there comes a point where I'm like, I don't care what the system is. It's it's you at the end of the day. So I think Derek Carr is a good quarterback, but I wouldn't say Derek Carr is a winner, I guess, if that makes sense. No, that makes sense. And, uh, I know, Judge, you wanted to talk about uh, Nathaniel Hackett uh, getting fired, not even making it through his first full season. Uh, where do you think Denver's going to go from here? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, you're hearing Sean Payton's name being mentioned a lot lately. Uh, I, 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 I heard a story that he is putting together an all-star coaching staff uh, to, you know, prepare for next season, and he wants to coach again. Uh, Denver could be one of one of the teams that he ends up, uh, you know, going to. Uh, if Denver takes that next step and, and decide to hire Sean Payton, uh, I think Sean Payton would be good for them. I think Sean Payton will, you know, install a winning culture. I think Sean Payton uh, will turn things around for that organization. I think that's the voice that they need uh, moving forward. Nathaniel Hackett clearly wasn't the answer, shouldn't have been hired in the first place. The only reason he got the job because the Denver Broncos thought they were in play for Aaron Rodgers. And, and they, they, you know, really thought that they were going to land him um, in a trade. It didn't happen, so the Broncos got stuck with Nathaniel Hackett. But uh, uh, it, it's bigger than the coaching, obviously, but I do like Sean Payton. Um, uh, I think he's a, a, a suitable fit uh, for that organization, and I think he will do um, a terrific job Um redirecting that franchise and, and, and getting that franchise back to where it once was uh, because they're in bad shape right now. There's obviously a lot of infighting. Uh, there's obviously a lot of friction in that locker room. There's uh, a lot of turmoil. And, you know, there's no chemistry. There's no continuity as well. So uh, Sean Payton is that guy who, you know, uh, could be the backbone uh, for that organization, and I, I just like the, the person he is and what he stands for, 
and that he holds his players to a, a certain standard. And I think that would be great for the Denver Broncos. But the bigger problem is Russell Wilson. We're hearing all these stories about Russell Wilson, and it could be it could be hearsay for all we know. I mean, it could just be uh, rumors. We we're not there to see what's really going on. But then you're hearing players complain about him getting uh, special treatment. You know, players are are, are 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 complaining because he has a parking his own parking space, and and now apparently his own office. Um, so there's a lot of division. Uh, there's there's people going back and forth at each other. You know, you got offensive linemen going at it with the backup quarterback, Russell Wilson going at it with offensive linemen. That can't happen. You know, as a quarterback, you got to be the leader. So I think Russell Wilson is also the problem. But I think with Sean Payton uh, and his presence, I think that could um, help, you know, kind of uh, – you know, get things back to where it was. What do you think about uh? And this one's for anybody. I just this is my personal question because Jay, I think you make great arguments, but how much of a say do you think Russell Wilson has with the organization right now about who he wants as the head coach? Because to me, it's like one hundred percent. I mean, that's that's the issue though. If if no one on I... the team likes you, and you're the problem in the organization, do you really have that much of a say? Because I said this, I think Daryl Bevel is going to end up the coach in Denver because Russell Wilson's best years are when Daryl Bevel was his offensive coordinator. That's and if you give Russell, if you give Russell Wilson, not even if you give Russell Wilson fifty percent say in the coaching hire, he's going to ask for Daryl Bevel to interview. He's going to ask for Brian Schottenheimer to interview because Brian Schottenheimer was also his offensive coordinator in Seattle when he had basically his best year ever. Right, but I think that's the issue right now. Is you know, it's not like, uh, like respectfully. Josh Allen, Justin Herbert, Patrick Mahomes, Lamar Jackson, if they go into the office and say, hey, I'd, I'd like this individual to be interviewed, I don't think anybody in the organization would have a problem with it because they're stand-up guys. But if Russ really is creating as much friction as people are saying he is, kind of trying to be bigger than himself with this huge ego, uh, which has always been there. I don't know why people think that's new. Like, it's he's always kind of been that douchebaggy Hollywood kind of guy. But um, he's just different about it because his wife is more famous than he is. So that's a whole different. Uh, anyways, <laughs> but um, that's my shot of the day, Gonzo. But, um, yeah, I mean, me personally, if I'm the organization, I do what's best for my franchise for the next five to ten years. I don't care about Russell Wilson. I'm we and, and to Jonathan's point, if I'm Sean Payton, Sean Payton doesn't play that shit. Like, Sean Payton's going to check that at the door very quickly. So if I'm Sean Payton, I might not even take that job. Yeah, right. Especially with all that's going on right now um, in that organization with uh, Russell Wilson and, and him I mean, how much with, you know, other players. Mm-hmm. How much of it was Hackett and how was on, is on Wilson? I think 95% of it's on Nathaniel yeah, Hackett. Hackett because he, had no, he, had no business, he had no business being a head coach. It's a good amount. It's a good amount. I watched a lot of their play. It was just, you know, you have different versions. And I think Gonzo, Gonzo hit it on the head talking about Indy just a few weeks ago. You know, I believe Saturday could have looked a lot better than he is if, if Jonathan Taylor's fully healthy. But even when Williams was healthy, even when Gordon was there, I mean, Gordon ran out the door. Gordon was like, F this. I don't want to be here. Like, this is – that's the state that it's at. So, you know, you, you, you can't run the ball well. You don't have a great defense. You have Patrick Sertan the second, who's a dog. But other than that, there's not really much going on. You got Chubb traded. There's just – Nathaniel Hackett was such an issue. And, you know, to Dustin's point, too, I don't really even fully believe that that was fully, a, a, oh, we're getting Aaron Rodgers hired. I just felt like that was a play in it. That was a part of it. But I truly do believe that the GM and the front office of them, John Elway and everybody, they all go hand in hand. They're all awful. And I think everybody in the Broncos organization should be fired. Don't you remember his um, opening press conference, too? They were asking him questions about, like, how he planned to coach the team. And he's like, I don't know how I'm going to coach this team yet. If it's fourth and 18 and they decided to call a fake punt and give it to the punter, we're going to give it to the punter and let him run for 25 yards. And, like, yeah. if, that's your first, if that's your first remarks in a press conference, that's a red flag right there. Oh, a big red flag. I would have turned his mic off right away. Right. And, you know, from um, a lack of 
situational awareness to questionable play calling to his stubbornness to give up play calling duties. Um, it was the latest casualty for that Denver Broncos team. And that's why they are in the state they are in because he didn't know what the heck he was doing. And well, a, he had zero experience and he had no business being a head coach. And they're in a bad situation because you that you got that bad Russell Wilson contract now. That's two. That two. That you signed them to. So you, you got you got to you got to stick with Wilson. So now you got to try to find a coach. You're stuck with him. You're that stuck with him back and, to playing at a better level. And it's clearly the worst trade in NFL history. You heard me say that the other day. It's the worst trade. I I disagree with you on that one, Jonathan. Just because I find it very difficult that Russell Wilson forgot how to play football in one year. I and if you right, if, if you look at Nathan, if you look at the Nathaniel Hackett offense. The Nathaniel Hackett offense is an offense designed to be run by Aaron Rodgers and his strengths. It's not designed to be run by Russell Wilson and his strengths. And I think that was the biggest issue that Hackett put in a specific offensive scheme because he was hoping to get a specific quarterback. And when he didn't get that quarterback, he never adjusted the offensive scheme to suit the best strengths of his new quarterback. Yeah, you know, you you you, you got a good point there. But the Denver Broncos, man, they gave up a lot. They gave up a couple firsts, a couple seconds, you know. Uh, they gave up, what, four players? They they basically mortgaged their future for a veteran quarterback that they thought would help them win now, and it has turned out to backfire. Um, and now they're in this situation. It, it's, I wonder, it's, very, it's very complex and perplexing. Maybe you could see a swap between uh, Las Vegas and Broncos. Maybe. Sorry, what was that, Mike? You cut out. I didn't, I didn't hear what you said. Oh, my bad, Big Gunny. My bad. Um, I said maybe you could get a swap between the Raiders and the Broncos for uh, Wilson, and obviously, <laughs> you know, they're cut. They're gonna cut cars, so the Broncos. Could, I don't know. I don't know what goes into that. There's a whole contract thing. I'm just throwing it out there. Probably can't actually happen, but Stack Guy's my guy for that one. I don't know if I don't know if Wilson has a no trade clause. Yeah, I'm, I'm not sure on that either. Do, do you think do you think that uh, the Broncos would be a job Sean Payton would be interested in? No, I don't think so. I think, you know, the thing, and we talked about it the other day as well, you know, I, I truly stand by this, especially, you know, looking at Jonathan's Rams, looking at the Tampa Bay Bucks when they won with Brady. They truly were a quarterback away. They, they needed Tom Brady. They needed Matthew Stafford at the time. Um, they had everything else. There were 52 men on that roster, and then including the coaching staff, the Tampa Bay Buccaneers and the Los Angeles Rams, before they made their quarterback trade, were one guy away. Maybe you make the conversation, well, you bring in Odell as well, you bring in Gronk. Um, but the biggest thing for me is the Broncos thought that they were a quarterback away. They weren't. I mean, they, they, they really weren't. Noah Fant, who's a stud in my opinion, uh, you know, leaves. Obviously, that leaves a huge question mark with Albert and what he's going to be at the tight end position. You lose Chubb. You lose a big part of your defense. Kyle Fuller and company are gone. Um, Bryce Callahan's aging. You lose your defensive coordinator and Vic Fangio, who was your better head coach, if you ask me. Um, Might have actually done well with Russell Wilson. I don't know. But, um, you know, there's there's so many things for me where when I look at Sean Payton. Did you lose Jonathan, Javante Williams? Yeah, you, you have Javante Williams. But the biggest thing Jonathan said was, you know, Sean Payton's putting together from what we're hearing. I don't know what that looks like. I'm curious to see what that looks like. Um, uh, an all-star coaching. They've, they've already they've already announced who he, want, who he has as his offensive coordinator and defensive coordinator. I'll definitely have to check that out. But Vic, Fang, Vic, Vic Fangio is the defensive coordinator. Then that, that, my guy ain't going back to Denver doing that shit. Like, no way. <laughs> He's not going back to Denver to be the defensive Who's the coordinator. Offensive coordinator? The offensive coordinator is Ken Wisenhunt. That's Hunt. not bad. But I think my biggest thing with that is, you know, you have an all-star unit of coaches, but you don't have an all-star team. So I think that's where you look at teams like the Dallas Cowboys, who have a pretty sustainable roster right now. You look at other teams like maybe the Chargers or the Raiders or, you know, teams that are just a little bit closer um, than the Denver Broncos. I mean, hell, I would take them on the Chicago Bears. Matt Eberflus hasn't impressed me at all. Um but, you know, and a big one, too, and I know my guy, my guy, Stack Guy might not like it. Um, 
but you know the the Detroit Lions to me, the Detroit Lions are right there. Um, and I like Dan Campbell as like a vocal leader, but when you talk about strategically understanding the game of football, ten times better you bring in Sean Payton and his team. Yeah, yeah, I can't argue that, and, I'll, and I'm a Dan Campbell fan as well. I, I like Dan Campbell. I like him too, yeah, and I, I like think he's doing good there in Detroit. But uh, yeah, I mean. Yep, I like I, Dan Campbell I too. I like his energy and his fiery demeanor. And I think I think that his Lions players have taken on his personality. And it has had an effect on the, a positive effect on that team. You can see it each week. Yes, sir. Sorry, I was, uh, Oregon just scored a touchdown to, to base probably win this game against North Carolina with like 15 seconds left. What ball will be? What ball I will be right back though, fellas. I gotta go park really quick. Okay. Okay. We'll uh, see you in a minute. Uh, what? What ball game? Hey, Chris. Is Chris, were you talking about Drake May earlier? Yeah. I'm gonna say this right now. Do not be surprised if Drake May ends up in Wisconsin. Tell you what, man, he, 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 because he, he can throw the ball. Because his offensive coordinator from this year went to Wisconsin to be Luke Fickle's offensive coordinator. So don't be surprised if Drake May has maybe a little bit of a down year next year. I'm not saying he's going to have a terrible year, but just to go and say if he has a little bit of a down year compared to what he had this year, don't be su- surprised if he ends up transferring to Wisconsin to rejoin the offensive coordinator. Uh, Johnson's the holiday bowl. There's one second left. North Carolina has it. Has, has oh, okay. a, has that's the bowl score. game that's played in San Diego. But it was uh, that that one's played here. And Oregon scored was... a touchdown with 15 seconds left and got the uh, extra point to get up by one point. Oh wow, that Drake is. Drake may just do a hail mary. So yeah, Oregon ended up winning the game. But yeah, North Carolina was in the lead the whole game until the last 15 seconds. Wow. Yeah, that seems like it was a pretty good game. Uh. Too bad I didn't watch it. <laughs> I did watch the Lakers, though. I, I course, watched no NBA but tonight. Of course, they damn near gave me a heart attack again. I watched my Pacers win another game last night, but I didn't watch no I didn't watch no NBA tonight. I've been watching college football. Like I said bowl, bowl games have been good, man. I know uh, Stat, I know Stat guy want, had a little bit of baseball. Uh, he wanted to talk some uh, Carlos Correa. We'll, talk, we'll do that, and I wanted to also talk a little bit of NBA. Yeah, because I want to talk about Luka Doncic's big night last night. Let's jump in. Then we get into the Eagles too. We'll get into Jalen Hurts a little bit. Oh yeah, Eagles. Let's let's do the Eagles first. Let's go ahead and go to the Eagles first. All right. Uh, What do you think the Eagles are going to do with Jalen Hurts? Do you think they're going to set him the rest of the season? And if if they do, do you think that's a good choice? We've seen quarterbacks struggle coming off a bye week, let alone three or four weeks. Yeah, yeah, but. I I don't think there is a reason to bring back Jalen Hurts before the playoffs. You should rest him. um, Let him get 100% healthy. Make sure he's ready to go. I think you rest him. You you sit him out. There's no reason to play him. The Eagles should double down on resting Hurts until the playoffs now. Um, You know, that's that's what I think. I think, I, I think you take it slow. You don't rush him back. There's no need. Let Gardner Minshew, uh, you know, take over for now. Um, he has proven that he is capable. Uh, you know, yes, they lost a game against sitting the Dallas out Cowboys. Long, sitting out that long, don't worry you about coming back and having and having rust after sitting no, out that long. No, that that doesn't that doesn't concern me. Um, it doesn't concern me one bit. You you want him Ooh. healthy because he's your. He's your I guy. I understand you want him healthy, but we've also nah, I, I'm not worried about quarterbacks. Him. We've also seen quarterbacks struggle when they get long, right when you when you don't play. That's true. You, That's lose, true. That, you lose that rhythm. That's true. I, I'm not worried about him losing his rhythm more than anything. I just want his body to heal right, and and so he's able to get back on the field. Um, I think Jalen Hurts is that damn good that he will make an impact when he does come back. He's going to do everything he can to to do uh, everything he can to to get healthy um, in time. And, you know, the Eagles, man, regardless, they're going to clinch the division. 
Um, the Eagles can't clinch the, the NFC East and the number one seed in the, you know, um, the NFC uh, are the, for the, wait, the number one seed in the NFC playoffs with either a win over the Saints or the Giants. So, I mean, even if you lose this game, you still got a chance to clinch the division, which I think they will. They're going to hold on, uh, no question about it. But I think um, the best remedy for Hurts' shoulder is rest and rehab. And here's another thing, too, guys. If Hurts sits out the rest of the regular season, he'll get five weeks of rest. If the Eagles clinch the number one seed, and and then he'll get four weeks if if they don't. So, um, I mean, you know, I think I think they'll be fine. I think you take it slow. Uh, you trust the process. You let him heal. You let him get completely healthy, and then you you hopefully you, he'll be ready to go uh, when the playoffs come. See, uh, that's the that's that? that's the thing though, Jonathan. At this point. The Eagles can't afford to rest him because if Philadelphia loses next week or this week and Minnesota wins, they're tied for the top seed. Granted, Philadelphia has that tiebreaker, but at that point they have to play Jalen Hurts in the final game of the season because I would rather have Minnesota come to Philadelphia than Philadelphia go to Minnesota. So even if rest is the best option, the only game that matters right now for Philadelphia is less so their game this weekend and more so if Green Bay can beat Minnesota because if Green Bay beats Minnesota, then Philadelphia can sit Jalen Hurts because they have everything locked up. But if Minnesota wins and Philadelphia loses, that final game of the regular season is going to determine home field. And if I'm Philadelphia, Minnesota plays Chicago week 17. Mm -hmm. I'm pretty sure Minnesota is going to beat Chicago in week 17, which means at that point you have to play Jalen Hurts just to make sure that you can clinch that home field. Yeah, that that's yeah, yeah. That that that's a fair argument for sure. Um, I I think the Eagles though. I think they trust Gardner. I I think they trust him. He you know it. He didn't have that bad of a performance. I mean, he was okay. He could have been better. Uh, but you know the guy didn't really have much game action. You know until last week. So let's see how he plays. Uh. This upcoming week, I know a quarterback hasn't been decided. I don't think a quarterback has been decided this week. Uh, but I think you stay with, with Minshew. I, I I think I think he's your best bet right now. What do you what do you think, Mark Hughes? About the Eagles, uh, the Eagles what do the Eagles do? Do they rest Jalen Hurts the rest the rest of the regular season? Or or do you have to play him these last two games and Make sure you make sure you get that uh, home get that home field advantage in the number one seed. Jalen plays the last game. That's the way I would see it. I think you give Jalen as much time as possible. But one, you want home field advantage throughout the entirety of the playoffs. Which all you need to do is win one game. Um, I don't know who they play this week, but I love Minshew. He, he you know, he, the same reason I love Trubisky. You got all the heart in the world, but uh, they do not. <laughs> They, they do not suffice in what the Eagles offense is supposed to look like. So um, one biggest key factor is rust. You don't want Jalen Hurts to be rusty in his first playoff game. First really big playoff game he's ever played as a Philadelphia Eagle. Um, so you really don't want that. So you want him to have those reps, at least in the final game of the season. I would play Jalen the last game, uh, especially if you haven't clinched the home field advantage already. Yeah, I, I think that's what they'll do. Sit him this week and then maybe play him the last week if uh, if you don't have it clinched. My stomach hurt. Which, which I, I <laughs> sorry. Which I I, I think I would I'd at least sit him this week. But and then if you, I don't know, I'd almost play him the last week too, just because I'm afraid of the rest aspect. Because you see a lot of these guys. I mean. I've watched it year after year with Peyton Manning in Indianapolis. We get a first round bye, and and we wouldn't play the last we wouldn't play the last couple of weeks of the season, and we go into playoffs, and our offense looked terrible. Yeah, no, because, definitely because we had three four weeks without without play, playing any football, without a doubt. Uh, uh, Jonathan, was there any other NFL NFL topic you want to talk about before we went to baseball? 
Well, we're going to talk about the Dallas Cowboys and yep. uh, Cowboys, and if they can win the Super Bowl or not. Hell no. Do you think are the Cowboys no. a Super Bowl threat? No, I don't. I don't think they can make a run to the Super Bowl. And here's why: every year they have you believing, right? And then when they get to the playoffs, uh, they find a way to blow it, you know. And I think that's what the Dallas Cowboys do best. I don't think that Prescott. Um, it is is good enough to make the plays at the right time, and that's what they're gonna need him to do. They're gonna need him to make some big time plays and some big time throws in big moments, and I just don't think he's capable of doing that. Uh, so if you're gonna have a quarterback that's not gonna play a clean game and that's gonna turn over the ball, uh, in critical moments of the game, then you can pretty much forget it. Your season is 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 not gonna go very far. And I, I I know they have a damn good defense. They they have an all pro defense. They they have a, a, a smothering defense that gets after the quarterback. They they have a pretty good secondary, but the secondary hasn't uh played their best football lately. Uh, you know, Micah Parsons, they rely on him so much uh to be that 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 guy that you know, puts a lot of pressure on the quarterback, but they need help from other guys on that defensive front as well. I just don't see it with the Dallas Cowboys. And and there's times that the Dallas Cowboys, they play undisciplined football, and, and they wait to the damnest moments to do that, and that usually happens in the playoffs. So if Dak Prescott doesn't clean up his game and he continues to throw pick sixes and continues to throw interceptions and, and give the ball to the opposite guy in a different color jersey, then, you know, no. The Cowboys are not going to be – a Super Bowl threat, and I just, I just don't see it. That's the reality of it. The bigger question to me is: Is Dak Prescott a quarterback that that can lead Dallas to a Super Bowl? No. See, I he's, don't think he's so. Somebody no, he he's the he's the next Tony Romo. He's the second coming of Tony Romo. No, Tony I, Romo put up put up <laughs> great numbers during the regular season. The only difference is that Dak Prescott hasn't put up the greatest numbers during the regular season because those numbers are lost. Because he continues to throw interceptions. Yeah, I don't. I wouldn't say he's Tony Romo. I would give Tony a little bit more love than that. But um, not yeah. much, but a little bit. Um, I I think Dak. I'm a, I'm a actually ask Stack guy. Stack guy, are you here, sir? I think he's at work. Well, yeah, what's need? All right, man. <laughs> Fill me in on the 2018 Bears defense. How great were they, in your opinion? I would say probably top 10 in the last decade for sure, and probably even top 10 within the last 25 years just because they had one or two playmakers at every position. You had Eddie Goldman and Akeem Nix up front. You had Khalil Mack, Roquan Smith, Danny Trevathan in the middle. You had Eddie Jackson, Adrian Amos, Jalen Johnson, and um, Kyle Fuller on the outside. They really did not have a hole on defense. Now, Gonzo, why I brought that up to the defense that scored more touchdowns than most teams in the league at the end of the day, bro, I had Mitchell Trubisky as quarterback. So I love the Dallas defense. The Dallas defense is phenomenal. Micah Parsons is the truth. But you got Dak at the helm. And you've seen time and time again, that's just how it goes, man. It's a quarterback-driven league. And I think that's really what separates good, good teams from great teams is, you know, who can you trust in the very last moments of a game to really just sling that shit down there? And at the end of the day, you know, we might look at the weapons of the Las Vegas Raiders, but who's throwing that football? I think, one, you got to have – you, you got to be a psychopath. I truly believe that. At the quarterback position, uh, which I was third string in high school, um, third strings – hey, first string safety, third string quarterback. So, I, I started. I did start. I was just – I don't know why. I think it was – honestly, it's because I was white. But um, I was the only white guy on the team. Had to put me at quarterback. But – um. I was like Ryan Gosling and remember the Titans. But it, it, it reminds me so much of the Dallas team right now with that Chicago Bears team because at the end of the day, man, you know, you could have Devontae Adams and, and, and you know, Renfro and Waller and Jacobs and everybody else. And in this situation, you could have C.D., Gallup, Hilton, which, you know, whatever, um, Zeke, Pollard, all these guys. <laughs> Schultz. I love Schultz. Schultz is a dog. But at the end of the day, Jonathan – Who's throwing that football? 
Who on, else? Man. Dak Prescott. Like, come on, man. What are we talking about? Like, I can't trust that man with my life. I can't trust that man. You know, you we need 50 yards to sling it down like the like the Patrick Mahomes play against the Bills last year. That was phenomenal. But at, at the end of the day, if you told me name three other quarterbacks that could have made that play, no one's making that play. No one's making that play. So it's it's nah, man. Dak Dak's right. Dak's, Dak's yeah. awful. I'm not going to slander him, but Dak's awful. Exactly. And uh, you know, I don't like and I mentioned that last week too. Uh, I don't like the slander and the hate that he gets, but you know, a lot of times when he takes shots down the field, uh, it, it's a it's an interception, right? You know, because he's not making the right decisions with the football. But we know that he's talented. We know that the talent's there. You know, we know that that Jerry Jones obviously believes in him because he paid him. You know, he paid him to be his his starting quarterback. Uh, uh, so you know you you see something there in him, and he definitely has the qualities. Uh, he's definitely a competitor. He, he he's tough because this is a guy who has fought through injuries and and found a way to get back on the field. But he just makes the damnest decisions at the, at the worst possible time, and you know the Cowboys end up paying for it. And the defense, man, they you know they. They do everything they can to to give the ball back to the Cowboys and and to keep the game close, and then the the offense finds a way to let them down because of that uh, Prescott and his his play on the field. Well, I, I see. I think I think it's some Dak Prescott, but also I think some of uh, Kellen Moore. Uh, yeah. Oh football. yeah. And then, uh, but Prescott leads he leads the league in interceptions since he came back from his injury, and. To me, if the Cowboys would have kept – if Kellen Moore had kept the same game plan and kept calling the plays the same way he did when Cooper Rush was quarterback in that team, when Dak Prescott came back, I think Dallas is better. Get that run game going. Rely on that that, that two-headed monster you have right now with Pollard and, and Zeke. See, that's that's the question for me, though, Gonzo. You know, you asked me earlier who should play versus Hurts and Minshew, but I think the conversation should be should you go back to Cooper Rush. Hmm. And there's a lot of cowboy fans that's been, uh, you know, asking for that. You know, they they they've been wanting to see Cooper Rush as the starter and not Dak Prescott because mm-hmm. they have completely lost trust in him, and they just don't think that he is gonna get it done for them. So they want to see Cooper Rush because they know how the momentum, how the 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 Dallas Cowboys were able to maintain momentum when he was out there on the field. Um, that they were able to keep the train moving with him at, at as the quarterback. So I think a lot of people want to see that um, experiment again. And I think a lot of people uh, would like to see uh, the Cowboys try that out again. But you're not about to bench a quarterback that you paid a lot of money. For, right. You know, um, and, and that's the only reason why I don't see that move happening because Dak Prescott got paid to be a franchise quarterback. Now, has he lived up to that? No, not at all, because he makes a lot of mistakes with the football. Uh, uh, but, you know, you got to leave him in there and see what he can give you um, on offense. But I think another thing that the Cowboys need to do better, not be one-dimensional. Uh, you, you know, uh, 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 run the football more. You know, establish the run game. You you got a dynamic running back in Tony Pollard. You know, he has taken a, st- a step forward in his game has made tremendous progress. Uh, Zeke and honestly, Elliott, Zeke hasn't been bad this year. What? I said, honestly, Zeke Elliott hasn't been bad this he year. He hasn't. He hasn't been bad. And had, uh, that's because you can use him on certain downs. Right. Uh, you know, you, you can use him in a variety of ways now that you have Tony Pollard. And, you know, you're not relying on him so much to gain a chunk of the yards. You got Tony Pollard to do that for you. So. I mean, uh, I think the Cowboys need to focus more on that on that running game, and that would open things up for Dak Prescott, and maybe that would make life easier for him as well. Right. I think Zeke had a horrible start, but he's he's finished really strong so far on the year. Yep. Yep. Which is kind of uh, what do you think Zeke about the Cowboys, that guy? Oh, my bad, Mike. No, you're good. My thoughts on the Cowboys. Is that what you were asking? Yeah. 
My thoughts on the Cowboys are it's less about Dak Prescott and it's more about the Cowboys are only going to go as far as Kellen Moore takes them. Right. And if you look at Dak Prescott, yes, Dak Prescott makes a lot of mistakes, but he's also been one of the best statistical quarterbacks the last three years. The problem with Dallas is they have Tony Pollard, they have Ezekiel Elliott, and they have the personnel to be a run-first football team. But when you're paying Dak Prescott the money you're paying him, you're still trying to be a pass-first football team. And that's kind of the identity crisis they're in right now is they have a quarterback that's making elite quarterback money, so they want to be a pass-first team. But when you look at the personnel they have in place, they need to rely on the run, and that opens up things for the pass. And come the playoffs, if they're going to be going on the road to Philadelphia, going on the road to San Francisco and a lot of these places where the elements might not be the greatest, they need to change their identity to become that run-first football team because if they can do that, that defense is good enough to make it to the Super Bowl just because they get after the quarterback and they can first force turnovers. Let me ask you guys this. Let me ask you guys this. How far, how far does Dallas have to get from Mike McCarthy to keep his job? Eastern Conference, or sorry, NFC Championship. I don't know. I, I think I, I think if Sh- Sean Payton, man, if he wants to make a comeback, I don't know. I wouldn't be I wouldn't be shocked if Jerry Jones, uh, for once, make a change. For one, I say for once because very rarely do you see this guy make a change. He is so loyal. He is inflexible. He he. It, it, this guy is so stubborn that he he rarely accepts change. Uh, but I the only thing with that I, I the only think, thing with that judge the only thing with that judge is that Sean Payton's gonna want full control. Is, do you think Jerry Jones is going is gonna give him control? He's gonna have to eventually give up his ego if he wants his football team to get back to the Super Bowl. He's gonna have to eventually subjugate okay. his ego, uh, give up his power. Um, that's something that he has not been able to do in recent memory. But he's gonna have to, and and. I think Jerry Jones uh, realizing that reality is starting to set in and that he's getting older. I think I, I, I think I said this before that he's a bit more pragmatic now, you know, and uh, if you want to win a Super Bowl, you're going to have to, uh, you know, finally turn to a coach um, who is going to put his foot down, who's going to say, you know what? No. You're going to let me run the team the way I want to run it so things can run smoothly, and you're going to give me um, the ability to make my own personnel decisions. And I think if he goes in that direction, he's going to have to give leeway to a guy like Sean Payton. And why wouldn't you want to give it – why would you want to give him – a lot of control because he he knows what he's doing. He's won the Super Bowl. He's a Super Bowl winning coach, you know, and that's what you need. You need a, a Super Bowl winning coach. But so is Mc, but so is McCarthy though. Like McCarthy won a Super Bowl the year after Sean Payton did. So you can't really use the argument that Sean Payton's a Super Bowl winning coach because Mike McCarthy's a Super Bowl winning coach. Mike McCarthy has a higher winning percentage than Sean Payton. Mike McCarthy's been to the playoffs a lot more than Sean Payton. And if you want to say, well, look at the quarterbacks they had, Drew Brees and Aaron Rodgers. You can argue that Sean Payton had a better quarterback than what Mike McCarthy had, and yet McCarthy consistently made the playoffs as opposed to Sean Payton. Mm, that's a good point. I still take you still have to take into account that he had Aaron Rodgers when he was in Green Bay as well. So, I mean, I don't know. I, no disrespect to Mike McCarthy. I'm not throwing shade at him. I, I think he's done a fairly good job in his time in Dallas, but. You know, now you get this fancy name that's available, and that's Sean Payton, and 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 it it's also being said that he would love to coach in Dallas because that's his dream job. And so a lot make of people it. believe that's why he took the year off, right? So he can get that Dallas Cowboys job um, in the event that Mike McCarthy got let go by the Dallas Cowboys. So say so them make it to the NFC Championship game. And lose you you think you think McCarthy gets fired? You think they they change coaches? I think there's a a possibility that we can see that. I mean, I don't know though. If if Sean Payton gets hired somewhere else, I'll be very surprised to see Mike McCarthy, you know, get fired. I think the only way he gets fired if they don't go deep into the playoffs, and if Sean, uh, if Sean Payton is still available for hire. 
I think the only way that McCarthy gets fired is if they lose to Tampa Bay. I was gonna say get put out in first round. Otherwise, even if they make it out of that first round, he's not getting fired, even if Sean Payton is available. You can't fire a coach that is most likely going to finish the season twelve and five with the possibility of going thirteen and four. Thirteen right. and four, thirteen and four, ninety nine percent of the time is not only going to win your division, but you can actually get home field advantage with a thirteen and four record. So you're not going to get rid of it. You're not going to get rid of it. Right. Yeah, they they lost they lost their um one of their receivers in Amari Cooper the last couple of years. So it's basically been C D Lamb and nobody else. You had Dak Prescott hurt for what four or five games at the beginning of the season when they had to go with Cooper Rush, and yet the team is still in the position they're in. Michael McCarthy, Gallup is hurt too for a bit. Yeah, Mike Mc, Mike McCarthy deserves a lot more credit for this season than what he gets. Because any other coach that would have been put in that situation, not having Michael Gallup, not having Dak Prescott, would be lucky to be sitting at 500 right now. Yeah, that's true. No, I, I think McCarthy's done a good job in Dallas, but you keep hearing, oh, if, if they don't win a Super Bowl, he's going to be gone. But I, I think as long as he don't get put out, like, like Stat Guy said in that first round against – is he going to be, what, Tampa or Carolina? Yeah, uh, but see, that's the thing too. How often does Jerry Jones fire coaches after a, a bad playoff run? We've seen him hold on to Jason Garrett for a long period of time, you know. Um, so again, this is a guy who doesn't adapt to change really well, and he's inflexible, you know. And he's he's been that way for for many years, you know. That's that's nothing new about Jerry Jones. Uh, before we get out of here, let's uh, let's talk a little bit of baseball. I know Stack Guy had some, wanted to talk some Carlos Correa. Uh, what what do you want to talk about, Stack Guy? I think Correa is done. I think Correa is done in terms of he's never going to see a contract bigger than five years ever again. Hmm. And if you look at the injury that he has that everyone's concerned about, it's not even an injury that they're concerned about. When he was in the minor leagues nine years ago, he suffered a serious broken leg on a slide at second base when he was playing shortstop. He needed two metal plates put in the lower part of his leg. That is the concern that a lot of people have right now is that those metal plates need to be replaced in the next couple of years. Once that happens, those plates are going to have to be replaced every eight to ten years. So you sign a guy to a 12-year contract, you're going to have to replace those plates at least twice during the tenure of that contract, which means at most you're going to get 10 years out of that 12 years out of him because he'll be sitting out an entire year once you get those plates replaced. So now nobody wants to give him that long-term deal because the longer he plays, the more likely it is that he's going to have to have those plates replaced. So now you have, I think they said yesterday, 12 teams have already contacted the Mets about what they're going to do because the Mets have already said they're not giving him a 12 year contract. The Mets have countered with an eight year, $265 million contract. And Carlos Correa is not budging on the 12 year contract. So if he continues to hold tight on this 12 year deal, the Mets are not going to sign him. They're going to let him hit free agency again. And there's already seven or eight teams that have been willing to give Correa a four-year, hundred and fifty to one hundred and sixty million dollar offer. He might be put in a similar situation like he was put in last year, where you sign a three, four-year deal for a lot of annual money. The team gives you an opt-out after year one and year two, and you can try your luck elsewhere. But he's not getting a contract more than five years because nobody's going to take that risk, knowing that the plates are going to have to be replaced soon. Well, if he goes back on the market, he's going to have to lower his price. And he's gonna have to take a, 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 a shorter deal if no one's gonna offer him the deal that he's seeking. He's gonna have to settle for for what he can get, the, the offer that's out there. You know, yeah, well, and, yeah, and I'm with you, stat guy. I think he might get a deal like he the similar to the one he got in Minnesota. No, I agree, and that's probably gonna be the kind of deals he's gonna get from 
here on out is going to get these three, four year deals with maybe the player option and uh, maybe tr- like stat guy said, try free agency again next year, but he's, it, you're never going to get a contract over uh, no set. I don't think over set six, seven years. Uh, yeah. The, the Cubs have already said yeah, they're the these. Cubs. The Cubs already said they're willing to give them a four year, $160 million contract with an opt out after year, year two. Giants have already said they're willing to give him a four-year deal. Twins are ready to give him a four- or five-year deal with an opt-out after year two or three. But right now, the situation is people know that he's worth that kind of money, but how long can he play at that kind of level before that leg becomes a serious concern? Even with the designated hitter, if those plates need to be replaced, you're not going to be able to stand so it's not going to matter if you have a DH or not, and nobody's going to invest that kind of financial responsibility on the guy that they may only get five or six good years out of him before he hits a heavy decline. Or like I said, if he does sign a 12-year contract, you're guaranteed to miss two years of that contract having two surgeries to replace those plates. I can see their logic. I can see their logic. But why wouldn't this ever talk, why talked about? Sign him to why him. wouldn't this talk ever talked about when he uh, signed his other contracts? Why? 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 Was it just because he would want a Why do you, think, why do you think? Deal? Why do you think he only got the contract that he got last year? He hit the free agent market last year, and he was the prized free agent last year. There wasn't that group of short stuffs that they had on the market this year. There wasn't the group of pitchers that they had on the market this year last year. Carlos Correa was that prized free agent last year. And he was trying to get that eight to 10 year, 30 to $35 million contract last year. And what did he take a three year, $110 million deal with a opt out after year one? Why was that? Because there was concerns with his physical last year. This isn't the first time that there's been issues with his physical it's just been more brought to the center of attention this year because of the two contracts that he signed or two contracts that he was in agreement with this 13 years at 350 and then 12 years at 315. Last year during the free agent process, he never actually accepted a deal. It was more so teams were talking to him, found out that there was concerns about his physical, and then they really never offered him anything, which is why he kind of had to take that three-year deal by the Twins because that was the best offer he was going to get. Now teams really jumped the gun because they wanted this high price shortstop. They wanted a guy like Correa, so they jumped the gun. They gave him the contract. They accepted the contract, and then they got him into the facility for the physical, and that's when the concern started. So now Correa is basically in a situation where it's like, I either try to hold out and get my 12-year deal knowing that I'm not going to get it, or I have to just basically suck it up and say, if the best I can get right now from the Mets is eight years at 265, I'm taking the eight years at 265 and being done with it. Yeah, and you know what? I think he will settle for the eight years because I think he wants to be in a big city. I think he wants a chance to contend again, and he has that that opportunity with the Mets. Um, you know, he's in a lineup that uh, that's good from top to bottom. I mean, you you got you you're part of a lineup that can get 15 hits on average per night. Uh, guys that can, you know, uh, hit home runs and 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 send balls flying over the fences. Uh, so he's in a good place, and I, I think he definitely would like to be with the Mets. He you know he would have great teammates around him, Pete Alonso. Uh, you know, Frankie Lindor, and, and then you can't say enough about the, the rotation um, and the bullpen. So he's on a championship contending team, and I think he wants to be in a place where he knows he can uh, contend for a championship again. So I think he will, by the by the time it's all said and done, I think he will be a Met. And I, think I, don't, I, don't, I don't think so at all because Scott, no? Boris has, Scott Boris has already said he's filing a grievance. Hmm. And oh, if Scott Bor- if Scott if Scott Boris says he's filing a grievance, that basically means that there's no progress being made at either side's camp at this point, and it's pretty much a done deal that there's going to be no resolution made. Oh damn! I didn't hear that story. Damn! This yeah. is this Scott is Boris. Getting, this is getting, yeah. Scott uh, Boris little... is pretty much Scott Boris is pretty oh. much filing a grievance because he thinks that teams are overreacting and basically are talking kind of behind his clients back saying don't invest your money in Korea because 
of this instead of letting teams make the decision for themselves. Hmm. So if it goes to a grievance hearing, that's the end of any kind of deal with that that organization. Hmm. Wow. Wow. I, I would say the Matt, what do you think? Max Dilly's gonna get it's gonna be a four or five year deal. Yeah. Somewhere around somewhere around there, yeah. I think he gets a seven year deal for a desperate franchise. And I think I could see a team like I could see a team like the Dodgers or the Yankees giving him seven years. Because the Yankees don't really have a shortstop. And the Dodgers lost Trey Turner and they really haven't replaced Trey Turner. Outside outside of that, I don't see him getting more than a five year deal. But if it comes down to it, I could see Dodgers or the Yankees giving him a seven year deal, but I think that's the biggest he gets at this point. But I think I think the Dodgers have, you know, put themselves out of conversation. I don't think they're going to get into the Carlos Correa sweepstakes because of what the fans think of Carlos Correa, which I think is utterly silly, you know, because I don't think you ever base your decisions based on what the fans want. Uh, you, you know, you do it from an organizational standpoint and you do what's in the best interest of your franchise. And I, I think Carlos Correa will be uh, a, another bat that you can plug into that lineup. And he would definitely be a great uh, replacement for Trey Turner at shortstop. And I, I said this from the beginning of free agency started when they were talking about all the free agent shortstops. If I could pick who I wanted in order one to four, Correa was my number four choice. Because I don't trust Correa. You go back to the sign stealing scandal back in 2017. He was one of the leaders of that. It didn't take any accountability for it at all. Basically just said, well, every team does it, so we did it too. Well, they didn't do it the way you did it, and you can't even stand up there and admit that you were wrong for doing it the way you did it. Then he knew he had these plates put in his legs eight years ago and really didn't go about telling teams that, hey, eventually I'm going to need these plates replaced, so if you're going to sign me, that's something that you need to be aware of. He's just a very shady individual that I never trusted. And I didn't want the Cubs to invest in a long-term contract on him because I didn't want to get stuck with him. No, I no, I agree. I'd like to see the Reds go after a big name player like that, but we're not we're not go, going to go after. Uh, we're not going to spend that kind of money. Not right now, anyway. <laughs> uh, well, Judge, it, it, anything else you want to talk about before we get out of here for tonight? Man, this was a great show. Uh, thanks for coming on, Stat Guy. We, we really love having you on our show. It's awesome. And and we want to thank um, – we also want to thank Mike, my buddy Mike, for coming on tonight. I know he had to go. Uh, it was it was awesome. And thank you to our viewers out there for watching. Um, hey, what's up, Frankie? Thanks for uh, commenting. Um why are we always losing? Oh, I know why. Because all they do is turn the effing ball over. I hate my effing Lakers. Hey, you know how I feel. I don't know if you watch my. I don't know if you got over to TikTok and watched my rant tonight. Um, the Lakers are done at this point. There is no. There is no way they will savage their season. Um, you know, it, it's over for the Lakers. The Lakers turn over the ball more than a minimum wage job has turnovers among employees. I, I mean, it, it's just, it's just that awful. You know, um, the Lakers are, uh, um, are, are bad. They're, they're horrific. Um, you know, it's a damn atrocity. It's a national embarrassment. It's, it's bad. It, it's just bad. It's a state of emergency at this point for the Los Angeles Lakers. It is what it is, though. It is what it is. But I ranted enough. You guys can check out the video on my TikTok channel, Sports Judge, the Sports Judge 85. Check, check out my TikTok, the Sports Judge 85, and you will see where I went off on the Lakers tonight. And you guys can also uh, look back at some of my videos on my YouTube channel, the Sports Judge 85, as well. All right, yeah. Like, like Judge said, we appreciate everybody joining us. 
Appreciate Mike Hughes for jumping on for a little while. Appreciate the stat guy for jumping on for a little while as well. Uh, we'll be back on Friday, 11 p.m. Eastern. Be the lap, last episode of Gonzo and the Judge of uh, 2022 uh, uh, coming up this Friday before we bring in the new year. Uh, please hit that subscribe button on, on YouTube at Gonzo Sports Room. Like and follow on Facebook and Twitch as well at Gonzo Sports Room. I greatly appreciate it. Uh, also do the same for the All Sports All Plays Network as well. Got a lot of great uh, guys over there that are putting in work. Uh, you, you can also find me 1 p.m. Eastern, Monday through Friday, ASAP Afternoon Blitz. I have easy money. A sports betting show Monday through Friday, 3 p.m. Eastern. Got Gonzo and the Judge Monday, Wednesday, Friday, 11 p.m. Eastern. Horseshoe Talk Mondays and Friday, 6 p.m. Eastern. And then whatever other shows I end up on in between all, in between all those. <laughs> but uh, I, I try, try to stay busy that, that way anyway. But like I said, appreciate everybody watching. We'll be back on uh, Friday. Thought, to, thought tonight was a great show. Hope you guys enjoyed it. And uh, talk to you later, Judge. All right. Talk to you later, Gunzo. Take care, man.